Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I love this movie. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Sicario, which released in 2015 from writer Taylor Sheridan and director Denis Villeneuve. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows Emily Blunt's character, Kate Mercer, who is part of a SWAT team in America. She has been assigned to work with Josh Brolin's specialist group to help try to bring down one of the biggest Mexican drug dealing cartel leaders. But as Kate makes her way around with Josh and his team, she starts to question which side of the law is she really on and is what they are doing really justified? No, 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 no. Compas, compas. Suelta la pistola. So I was aware when uh, when this film came out. I'm a bit of a fan of Emily Blunt and mm. Josh Brolin, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm a, not really a fan at all of Benicio del Toro. Oh, Every yeah. time I've gone to see one of his movies, I think it was The Wolfman. Really, after that, mm. I just kind of went off him quite a bit. So much so that I kind of avoided any films that he was in. Wow. He just some happened to turn up in some of those films. But <laughs> yeah. I was just like, I, 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 everyone tells me you're a great actor, but I just don't see it or I don't believe it. Mm. Uh, and so I kind of let this film go, kind of forgotten about it. Right. And then Arrival came out and then Blade Runner 2049 came out. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And then Dune came out. And yeah. I was like, now who is this director? Yeah. Who yeah. is this Denis Villeneuve? And, uh, and then I, that's why I got quite the surprise. When I put this film on, and I was like, "Oh, it's, it's that yeah, guy who I really guy. like." Yeah. So I was like, uh, "So I had my apprehensions going into this film, but knowing who the director was, and then also the cinematographer for mm-hmm. the, for this film as well. If I'd known this ahead of time, I would have absolutely watched this film. The cinematographer for this film is uh, Roger Deakins, who just happens to be one of my favorite cinematographers from films such as The Shawshank Redemption in 1994, mm-hmm. Fargo in 1996, mm-hmm. Ooh, The Big yeah. Lebowski. Oh man, you know, Jesus, yeah, he's done a lot. A, a beautiful mind, no country for old men, and then of course Blade Runner 2049 as well. So I was like, man, this guy, like, why is he not been on my radar? Like, I'm aware of him, but not completely. And now I'm just like, this is one of the greatest cinematographers working. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, so I really, really should have checked out this film sooner. Well, I mean, I've seen this film like five times. Um, this is this was the fifth time for the review, and kind of like you, when it first came out, I wasn't really bothered by it. You know, there wasn't really anything in the movie that made me go, ooh, I really need to see that. Um, Like you said, Benicio Del Toro, I do like Del Toro. I've always kind of, I've liked him since License to Kill. You know, Snatch, he was cool in. But he does kind of play the same role in a lot of films, unless he's like clad in makeup, like he was in The Collector, as The Collector in Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, Josh Brolin, I mean, Goonies, yeah. No Country for Old Men, even better. You know, Danny came back as Thanos. And I'm like, hey, that guy's really great. Emily Blunt. Got nothing bad to say about her. No? Nothing. So, that's it. Like, if it's got (laughs) Emily Blunt in it, I'm on it. I'm fucking, I'm I'm gone. I'm in that movie. Um, But for me, like I said, I hadn't seen this until I watched the end sequence. It was on TV one night and I was flicking through and I just happened to catch the end sequence. And I'm, I'm going to try not to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen Sicario. But for those of you who have, then you know what I'm kind of talking about. You know, um, Benicio Del Toro's character making his way through the dark, dressed head to toe in black outfit, armed to the teeth. And then just what he does next is, we'll get to it. But I saw that sequence and I was like, oh my God, what is this film? Oh, it's Sicario. Oh, I'm going to need to see what led to this so when it was on a, on film four again i watched it i was like man that was really good then i saw sicario 2 day of solado or the soldado or whatever it's called and i was like oh that's all right and then a couple of months later sicario was back on again i'm like oh i'm watching that again and i watch it and then the review... I think there's, sorry there's not talks right now of a sicario 3 as well so <laughs> like, wow this is actually the beginning of a franchise now yeah they should but i i i don't think they should i think they managed to capture everything they wanted in the first one well i mean the first one establishes some pretty awesome characters yes. and so it's understandable that you'd maybe want more stories with them yeah but spoilers certain characters don't turn up in the sequel i, I know i'm aware you know? yeah um but i was i was going to do something new for this review i was actually going to sit here and just go 
hey Gary, <laughs> what did you think? Because I've seen this film five times and it's absolutely amazing. And you, you, this was your first time. It was my first time watching it. It was. <laughs> I mean, I can tell that it wasn't uh, Kate Maser's first time, uh, especially with this raid sequence. We yeah. get to we establish Emily Blunt's character, uh, Kate Maser, Maser as yeah. this capable, professional, hard nosed, by the book, yeah. and morally rightfully aligned uh, character. And we get established this in the first fifteen minutes. And I, I have to say, this opening sequence. Gets you right into uh, the, the the mood and the tone of the film right away. Yes. As we followed this SWAT team, this FBI team, mm. gearing up and racing towards this house. And again, spellbinding cinematography, your investment. We have our POV character as we mm. go into this raid. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can see that she's very capable of herself. You know, she is a true professional. When she gets shot at, mm. she ducks down. She manages to take that guy out. And then the whole house is seized and everything is, is taken care of. We find out that she's also here to rescue some hostages. Yes, yeah. But um, the hostages aren't in the house. They aren't aware. But they are aware of a bad smell. And especially where the shotgun, you know, yes. entrance is on the wall. They start to peel back the wall to find these corpses. And eventually they find like more than 20 of them in just this section of the house alone. Yeah. And so we get the, all the forensic team involved. And then there's a huge explosion outside which kills some of the officers. So, like, okay, this is... This is great world building, great character setup, because we see that she's gay, but we also see her and her partner vomiting outside. Yeah. So they weren't quite ready for this, but at the same time, now they kind of want revenge on the people that are doing this. Yeah. And we end up in the uh, sort of interview process, this glass room uh, where we have Josh Brolin, who he, I mean, we get the sense that he's a professional. After he's obviously he's in there with all these other Hell people. Yeah. yeah. But he's also wearing a shirt, and we also find out that he's not wearing shoes. No, no. <laughs> His his character Matt Graver is like a, a Department of Defense kind of specialist. This is the guy you call when you want something done, but you want it off the books. When you want it underneath the radar, you know. And so he is so casual at what he does. Josh Brolin's character, the way he plays his character is absolutely amazing. I, I, I was watching a Josh Brolin kind of interview talking about characters and he brought up this one and he said about how he was trying to establish who this character was, who he was, what he could bring to it. And it wasn't until he actually got a piece of chewing gum from somebody on set and put it in his mouth that all of a sudden he just felt so comfortable as Matt Graver, as this character, because he was just so laid back, you know. He kind nice. of he, he he knows how to analyze the situation and exactly what he does. He's got the right contacts. He knows who to call. He's got people in his pocket. He's in other people's pocket. It's deep, how deep Matt Graver goes. And and I, I mean I also want to bring up quickly Daniel Kaluuya who plays Reggie Wayne. Um, he's great in this. Uh, I I mean I've. I've kind of grown to really love him. The first time I ever saw him was when he told uh, Michonne in Black Panther that he was going to side with somebody else. And that's his wife. And I was like, dude, you messed up. You just told your wife you're going to do something that she doesn't want you to do. You're dead. You're, your character's dead from the series. Um, then saw him in, in uh, Nope. Yeah. Absolutely loved him in Nope. So then obviously going back and watching Sicario again, the way him and Emily Blunt kind of sit there casually looking back into the room, into the interview room, and he's like, what's going on? What are they say, and she's like, I don't know. And Matt Graver, he, he's happy to take both, but as he says, he doesn't need any lawyers, so he doesn't want Reggie there kind of causing any issues or anything. He needs somebody tactical, he needs somebody who kind of knows what they're doing in the situation. But he's also after, I mean, she asked the pivotal question really, it's like, are we going to be getting you know the ones responsible for the horrors that we saw at the yes. beginning of the film and he's yeah. like absolutely that's yeah. what we're... i mean he also had him his response is a little bit shady on a oh, rewatch totally. of that sequence you're just like eh. it's a shady mother yeah but i mean as we find out like she kate Macer is like she's on the front line she's doing these raids and she's trying to help people but there's a sequence later on in the film where we find out where she's not really making any difference. Like, the crime rates are still going up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so she sees this as an opportunity to join this, I guess, elite squad, this shadow, you know, organization yeah. of the government uh, to, uh, to actually make a difference. I think that's what also makes this film really kind of realistic and quite relatable is that, yeah, in movie magic terms, you know, she could be making a difference. And when they bring the bad guy down, you know, they're going to be going back to a peaceful life. No. 
in real life, they take out one guy and somebody else will take that place. Oh, absolutely. But at least they've made a difference for a small period and taken out that bad guy. I mean, bringing up Benicio Del Toro's character, Gillick, like, he is shady from the offset. Yeah. You feel kind of uncomfortable around him, but at the same time, you also feel like he knows what he could do in a situation. He comes across as almost very stoic and uh, reserved mm. and enigmatic, mm. really. We don't know very much about him. And interestingly, 90% of all of his character's dialogue was cut from the script. Really? And it was a decision that, uh, you know, uh, Villeneuve and, and Benicio came to. It was like... Your character pretty much establishes their backstory. They meet the complete stranger in Kate. Yeah. And then in the opening scenes, he explains her enti his entire backstory, why he's there, what happened to him. Mm. And so all the mystery is gone. Mm. So we already know who he is. So yeah. having having us find out about him throughout the entire film, like entire the last film. revelation comes in the last 15 minutes. Yeah, oh God, yeah. We find out this information as Kate does. So yeah. Kate is our avatar. She's yes. our aud audience surrogate for this film. Yeah. So... What she finds out, we find out. And so she doesn't find out anything. And that is that is what I really like about this film, is how they establish her as this really capable professional FBI agent at the start. Mm. Then she's she's not promoted in a way, but she no. volunteers for this other job yeah. assignment, yeah. and she knows nothing. Yeah. And those that are in that operation won't tell her anything <laughs> no, either. No, no. So we're left in the dark about what's going on. And before we know it, we're, we're on a car heading towards the borders of Mexico. Yeah. And we're like... You know, already Kate was already thought that she was going somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so I love you know her perspective in the car. She's looking around like, this isn't where we're supposed to be going. Yeah, yeah. And as they go across the border, and and again, just the cinematography and the music here oh, is yeah. what's so captivating. It's um, Johan Johansson uh, who did the music for the film, mm. and when he was getting ready to create the music, Villeneuve said to him like, "I want the music to sound like a threat." And the only yeah. other compar comparison piece I have for you is the theme tune to Jaws. So yeah. Johansson yeah. took that to heart. And if you listen to like the score of, yeah. especially the theme track of The Beast, mm. when that music and that cello kicks in, you are reminded of Jaws and that impending doom and threat yeah. as it speeds up and gets closer and closer. Yeah. And there's like entire 15, 20 minute sequences in this film where the tension just gets wrapped up and ramped up. Nothing is happening. No. But, but the, you're tense. But you're tense because Kate's tense. Yes. She doesn't know what's going on. And, you know, bullets could start flying at any moment. But they actually get to the prison. They yeah. get the prisoner. Yeah. They get back in the car and they're shooting off again. You're like, oh, all that tension for nothing. Yeah, but it's the way <laughs> they establish it as well. That they establish that they're if, if they're going to get hit. Because they've been told that they're going to drive all the way to this prison. Pick up this high-ranking member. Of, of the cartel. The, of the cartel. Yeah. Um, they're going to extradite him all the way back across the US, uh, the Mexican-US border. And once they bring him back into America, they can start questioning them. Um, they know that as soon as they leave the prison, they're going to probably be under fire from other gang members, cartel members, who don't want them to take this guy. Um, and they want this guy dead. And it's also the way that Gillick even um, says at one point, yeah, don't trust the local police either because they could be in the pocket. Um, and we we see a little bit of that, don't we? Because there's a there's a police officer called Silvio that you don't actually find out his name until towards the end. But obviously, Wiki and you know, looking into the notes, and we keep getting little snippets of him being at home. You know, his son's waking him up. Dad, can we go playing football? He's a, uh, Silvio's a police officer. Is he working for the cartel? Is he a good cop? It'll slowly come un uh, unfold as the movie goes. But I, I loved how that goes along with it because, you know, it's horrible that these people have to do these horrible things where they are just to survive. Well, but you will do whatever it takes for you and your family to survive. He is literally uh, like a, a, a parallel of Kate. Yes. Whereas, you know, they're yeah. both pawns mm. in a game that they don't understand yeah, or, yeah, or can't yeah. control. Yeah, yeah. And so they're both getting used by their superiors. Yeah. And so I like the contrast there. Yeah. Uh, and, and I also like the sequence where his kid goes to grab the gun and he's like, no. Yeah, don't ever touch You're that. not following that path like, yeah. of picking up guns. Uh, but 
I, so yeah, it's an interesting side story. At yeah. first, I was just like, okay, it's not really needed, but it will actually tie into the whole uh, yeah. as we get there as well. Yeah, because uh, we're going to go back to the the border crossing yeah, sequence, yeah. Oh. which uh, the cinematographer also said this was the most complex shoot of the entire film. It was so demanding that they couldn't use the real location, so they had to build a whole set. Oh, it's uh, amazing! Of this set. Because they they took several days of filming. Yeah. There. And, it, and yeah, obviously, as they're going back across the border, they're gridlocked. Yes. And this is where the tension really ramps it up, where you see these other cars pulling in and they're just inching closer. And the audio, the camera, the film is telling us these are gang members. They, you can't trust them. I mean, they're shaved heads, they're tattooed, Tattoo and they're up. concealing weapons. Yeah. And they're eyeballing these American trucks. Yeah. And so you're just like, okay, like something is going to go, what's going to happen? And then you've got the, the military guys, the SWAT team, they're just like, you know, remember rules of engagement. Yeah. We don't engage until they engage. If they open a door, we open a door. Yeah. One of them just winds his window down. <laughs> She's almost instigating it, really. And so one gang member gets out of his car, and that's it. That's it. All the cops are out, guns trained on them. This is where Benicio Del Toro's character, uh, Alejandro, is just like, peace yeah do you want to live do you want to die he's yeah. trying to talk them down he's trying to talk them down, but that yeah. other guy's looking he's looking he's looking he looks one way as a distraction and then gunfire yeah and i was and and it's about nine seconds of gunshots and i, I was honestly expecting like a heat style <laughs> yeah. you know scenario oh, where they're ending like up with the prisoners bit, it's a minimal one it is it's very minimal it gave me a hint of like mm. a michael mann movie yeah but i was like the cinematography here is sublime the action is done in a realistic way i mean i've not seen a real gun firefight but it looked believable the way that the actors played dead yeah uh it, it was great and of course we're following kate we're still in her pov for the most part in that car looking around yeah as we you know a shadow moves up behind her fires at her and she has to kill a guy yeah it's like, and and then they managed to get back uh, you know across the border and, and back to base i was like wow <laughs> like, I, yeah. need, I needed to pause the movie and just take a i just <laughs> That was great. Yeah, let's just go back. I gotta, I gotta bring up uh, Jeffrey Donovan, who plays uh, Steve Forcing. He's, uh, he's a great actor. I, I, I watched him in Burn Notice uh, with Bruce Campbell, mainly because Bruce Campbell was in it. Um, and he, he's just a really great character working alongside Matt Graver, Josh Brolin's character. You know, because they're communicating about bringing this guy across and things like that. And then just the whole time they're in the car. Because like you said, Kate's sat there. She's I have no idea what's going on. Gillick is watching around. He can spot a threat from freaking miles away. You know, and then you've got uh, Steve Forcing backing up with his Delta team. You know, they've got just... They, they've got the drop on these gangsters and they take them out. But but Kate is absolutely freaked out. What are we doing? What have we just done? You know, That just, was illegal. You've just killed a bunch of people. Yeah. And they're like, like, and there were civilians everywhere. Those people won't be on the news. Nobody will even care that they're even dead. And so they managed to get their target all the way back across the border to be interrogated. And I absolutely loved that sequence between uh, Alejandro and like his old friend. Right. They meet in the corridor. Yeah. And um, and that's when we find out that he does have well a backstory that something oh, happened yeah, to him. Yeah. And there's other guys very sorry for him. Yeah. And we also do notice occasionally that um, Alejandro has a wedding ring on. Yeah. But there's no wife or family in the movie. But it's that way that he turns to his mate and he's like, "You may not want to be here." And he picks up just this huge water container, and we'd already seen uh, Josh Brolin uh, and and Jeffrey Donovan in the room with the guy that they're going to interrogate and. You know, Matt Grave was just like, do you want to talk to me? And the guy's like, no, I'll play English. He's like, oh, no, I'll play English. Oh, okay. Well, I know somebody who you want to talk to. And then comes Benicio Del Toro and the guy's face just kind of drops. <laughs> he knows he's in trouble now. It's almost like a... this guy's like a specter, yeah. like a known yeah. you know, threat. <laughs> yeah, like he shouldn't be alive, but here he is standing in front of him. And it turns out that this lieutenant has information that they want. And he wants to be taken to America because then he can, he'll he at least live well, for a little while well, no, in an American I mean, jail. It, it, it was part of the plan, wasn't it? You know, um, Alejandro and, and, and Graver, there was their plan to cause trouble, to basically kick yes. the hornet's nest. Yeah, kick the hornet's nest. You yeah. know, they were just there to cause chaos uh, because they knew if they did this operation... You know the gang members would 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 be leaderless. So you've cut the head off the snake, and yeah, now it's yeah. it's going crazy. So that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to bring out the 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 gang lords out of hiding, well, and yeah. that's almost what they've done. And they're still trying to get to, I guess, oh, the head honcho. Well, that's it. They've they they want to try and capture Manuel uh, Manuel Diaz, who was the guy who supposedly owned the house at the beginning, and he's an underling for uh, Fausto Alacon, 
played by uh, Julio Cesar Cidelio, who is supposed to be this mythic, uh, you know, Colombian, uh, Mexican cartel drug lord. You know, you don't see him. He knows you and he will kill you and your whole entire family, but you will never see him. You deal with his underlings. So by taking out this lieutenant means that they can try and get to Manuel Diaz's money. And if they can get to Diaz's money, then he'll have to go back to Mexico. And that will be when they can yeah. try to get it. But, but no, Kate doesn't know it. Well, I mean, <laughs> she starts to learn this because at this point she becomes aware of how well she's being used. Yes. And she is not happy with anyone or anything. No. And she even goes to her old boss. She's just like, I can't believe like I'm trying to do this by the book. And he's like, you think you're doing it by the book, but you're actually not because this this operation doesn't actually have a playbook yeah so don't feel bad about trying to do yeah. the right thing here Is because it? the bigger picture and he's like and you know he took again it's where he talks about the crime rate and yeah. how they're not making any difference on the street they have to go to the source yeah i love that line where he's just like you th you think you're working outside the boundaries i'm telling you those boundaries have been moved yeah i'm like but that's it. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's the whole morality of yeah. her character because she is such a good person and she's in this world she doesn't understand potentially doing criminal things. Well, this is... The, but that, at the same time, balances with Matt Graver's character mm -hmm. is that he doesn't think he's a criminal because he's not because... He's working within the law that he's been given. It's just his law is being expanded. Yeah, he can kill a bunch of people at the border crossing because they're bad guys. They drew weapons. We didn't break the law. They're all dead. Don't worry about it. Um, but they, they go to a bank, don't they? And they come across some um, money mules that are working for Manuel. Um, and Kate realizes that actually they've got all the records through the bank of all this money that have been put in and so if they can get this they can build a case and she wants to do it legally and uh, Matt Grave is just like don't go in the bank do not go in the bank and so she goes into the bank and now her face is all over the CCTV it's being put out and so like Matt even says to her at one point like you won't get this a case they'll walk on this this is all information that can just be you know lost we want to really upset them that they are losing this money um and so she's so upset she's she you know she calls up her buddy reggie and she's just like i need a drink and the two of them go to a bar and that's where they happen to meet up with shane from the walking dead <laughs> Yeah, I was like, okay, so the film's taking a bit of a downtime here, you know, we get yeah. some... Kate needs some rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she needs some bonding. Yeah. You know, and uh, she, they, they talked earlier in the film about how she doesn't feel attractive or that she feels disheveled. And, yeah, same bra. Yeah, ex exactly, yeah. <laughs> Nothing sexy going on in her life. And no. so, like, okay, we see we see where this is going. And and, uh, and Bernthal's just, like, you know, aggressively flirting and dancing. And yeah. before we know it, they're back at her apartment. They're making out. We can see where this is going. I totally forgot. Like, I, I, I totally forgot. He knows Reggie. That's right, yeah. You know, the two of them are, are friends. So you also go safe. Oh, really. yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a safe guy. Um, but then when they're making out and they're at the place... She, she recognises the band, the money band the on the table. The money band, yeah, because she'd seen it at the bank. And so she realises that Ted, he must be involved in the money laundering as well. Um, but she doesn't, she doesn't make it too apparent. She just starts to kind of freak out a little bit. And so then he starts to freak out and then she goes to draw a gun on him. So he's kind of justified in defending himself, but he does go way too far. Well, he pins her down and ends up strangling her out. I mean, she's going to die right here. She's going to die right there, yeah. Uh, but Alejandro comes in and well, saves, saves her life. Yeah. In a way, that it turns out that she... She kind of been used as bait, you know. They were well, hoping she, to she, find somebody connected to them. She became bait by her own volition by yeah, going yeah. into the bank. By so going into the bank, the, yeah. we find out that the others just used her again for that. Because I'm like, well, you did it. So I think that's funny though that that Ted might have got the because Ted's a cop. Um, he's just on the payroll, so he would have got the information. But then it just so happened that Reggie brought her to that bar. Well, I'm guessing he was following them, so he was going to plant himself in whatever bar. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, nearby. yeah. I suppose that's another point. Yeah, well, he just he be he just so happened to be at that bar drinking, didn't he? Um, but yeah, they fucking they beat the crap out of him, didn't they? Yeah. Josh yeah. Brolin sat there, just absolutely chill, waiting for the right questions to be answered. Bloody 
Benicio del Toro sticking his finger in, <laughs> in, in John Bagno's ear. I'm like, this is the Punisher. He's getting taken out by a wet willy? Come on. <laughs> so all this is now leading up to a uh, a, a tunnel operation. Mm. Uh, there's a border section, Mexico-American border, where they're using this tunnel to smuggle the drugs or whatnot. So we've now got a full military operation to go in there and seize the drugs. Mm. That's what we think the mission yeah. is essentially about. Yeah. And again... Another fantastic cinematic moment where the director decided, you know, we're, I'm not going to do fake day for night shooting. I'm not going to overly oh, light yeah. this sequence. Oh. Uh, I want uh, we're going to shoot this in the pitch black. It was amazing. And we're going to get special cameras yep. with night vision yep. and, and infrared, or yep. and we're going to shoot it that way as well. And it's really uh, impressive oh, and it's it is. very effective as well as we follow the team in as they just disappear into the darkness of these yeah. tunnels. Yeah, yeah. And what I love is that once the firefight begins, we don't really see any of it. We see people shooting into the darkness. Yeah. We see nothing. Yeah. And again, kind of almost similar to the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the the border control sequence with Kate. We follow now Kate through this tunnel. Yeah. Uh, as she eventually emerges on the other side. And that's where we see Alejandro apprehending uh, Sylvia, yeah. the, the, the the corrupt cop, and she gets shot. Yeah, he shoots her because she's she's pulled the gun on him because she thinks he's going to murder this guy. She doesn't know what he's up to. She she also has a feeling that Gillick isn't really part of the unit. He's a Colombian uh, hitman or Sicario, as the film had told us at the beginning. That's right. Sicario um, literally translated, I think in Spanish or in Italian, is like assassin or yeah. hired killer. Yeah. yeah. And so I think she, it derives from a, a, a Latin name as well. Yeah. yeah well, the, the, like I said, that thing at the beginning it said something like a zealots in Jerusalem killing Roman soldiers, you know, and then obviously it's, the words of old there into, yeah. into Hitman. Um, but she thinks he's going to kill this cop. She's trying to obviously stop him. He shoots her, but... He doesn't kill her. He doesn't kill her. He purposely shoots her in the armor to knock her out because he's on a deadline. He is being sent off. And I kind of felt this the first time when I watched it. And obviously as the film, I've watched it multiple times. It, just, it, it always feels like whatever these guys are doing, it's for Alejandro. Matt Graver has done this whole operation for his friend. You know, you don't know that until it's revealed to you in the next five, ten minutes. Um, but everything that they have done, it's, like I said, it's it's under the radar. It's out of the books. It's personal. Yeah. And, and Kate doesn't really get that yet. She wants it personal, but she's still trying to run that justified line of, I want to be the good cop bringing them in and taking them to jail. And Gillick's the type of person who says some people aren't supposed to go to jail. Yeah. And so I love the bit like, like there's that bit just before where Reggie says to her, like cover my back and he runs off, but she runs off after Alejandro. And I'm like, you've just left your partner to almost die. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to lose you points when you get back with him. And then she has that confrontation with Matt, doesn't she? Once they come out of the tunnels. That's she, right. She's first lost. And he explains, this is where he explains everything. Oh, yeah. 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 He sits down and he explains to her what they've been doing. And it's the that way. His wife was decapitated yeah. and that his daughter was thrown into a vat of acid. And, yeah. And that's why he uh, is now hell bent on revenge against those responsible. Yeah. Alejandro, and, not Matt yeah, Graver. Alejandro. Yeah, it's, it's Alejandro. <laughs> and, so then I'm, and, and so with this revelation coming towards the end of the film, because now Alejandro is the now protagonist for the rest of the film. Mm. I was like, he kind of is the main character. Yes. Granted, Kate is our POV. Yeah. But it's not her story. Yeah. It's his. Yeah. And uh, and and because of the fact that his character was reduced down, you know, verbally yeah. to basically uh, the way that he carries himself on the screen in his actions, that defines his character. Yeah. And he is the he's the one on revenge. And I love the fact because like on you know thinking about the film afterwards. Yeah. If it was, like, it'd just be another John Wick, you know? Oh, it'd yeah, just be another yeah. revenge movie. Yeah. But the fact that it's the narrative is done in such an interesting way where our POV is on the side watching this yeah. because, because we follow this morally good person, we question those that are doing, you know, going for the revenge yeah. as being villainous or yeah. evil or wrong. Yeah. And so usually when you follow a revenge movie, you're rooting for the person to get revenge always. But yeah. because we have this perspective... It's different. And because the film's so masterfully told as well, the story is, it, it it's so captivating and engrossing. And I love the fact that, I mean, even her character, because we're, 
like if it was a normal film mm. uh we'd be instantly with these two guys rooting for them and would be waiting for kate to sort of get on their wavelength and and then the three of them can go and take down and get their revenge. Yeah, That'd be yeah, a yeah. standard story. Yeah. Because those guys, they're kind of having fun. They're laid back. They're not taking it too seriously, even though it is very serious. Yeah, yeah. That's their mentality. And yeah. Kate is like a roadblock towards them and everywhere. But then that's because she's being used and they've kept her in the dark. And so yeah. all, of, all of those things, I just think, is what helps make this story that much more interesting. That's, that's what I mean. Why I, the second one's not as great as the first one, because they're missing the Emily Blunt character. You know, everybody saw everything that Alejandro did in the first first one they're like oh well we want to carry on with him but then when you get into the second one it like you said it just feels like an extended john wick movie mm -hmm. where they're going out and they're taking out more cartel members and stuff like that you need the emily blunt kate character as as gary said the surrogate audience member you know i love following her because yeah i want to be justified i want to be on the good side i want to bring people to justice and see them do their time but then when I get told that a man's wife, because because it you know Gillick wasn't a hitman right from the start. He was a state prosecutor, and the cartel killed his wife and daughter, and I think possibly tried to also kill him as well. Yeah, but he was doing things by the book. By doing things by the book. Now he just now he's trained himself, hired himself out. It's the way that Matt Graver says, "Look, you think we're wrong, but he's going to do this anyway." But we just give him the advantage of knowing and sending him off. And doing the path and you want to have these people killed or taken out this is how you do it and so like i said then we get to this beautiful end and he's he's uh alejandro has made silvio drive him as far as he can to follow uh, uh, uh manuel diaz because diaz is heading to fausto's house and they don't know where it is and he he ends up killing silvio which i thought was a bit harsh yeah yeah but then at the same time Gillick can't have any witnesses. He can't have anybody getting back. That's and this right. guy was involved with the cartel anyway. So how good was he in a way? Um, and then he gets in the car with Diaz and they drive to Fausto's house. He kills him. He kills like the four guards at the door. You get that wonderful air shot and the, the guy over the radio saying like there's six more people in the house. And, and he then, kills one. He kills but one. But then he sees the maid and he kills knows one. that's all that's left that's is the it. family and the maid. It's just the family. <laughs> and this sequence, oh my God. It's tense, isn't it? It's brilliant. I could watch this sequence over and over and over again because it's just so fucking well done. Yeah, he controls that dinner table. Of course, the crime boss there, he's just sat there like, boys, you keep eating. Just, he you know, tries to be he really tries. confident and egotistical still. Yeah, he, he thinks he's getting out of this. Uh, but or he thinks he's gonna he's gonna get taken out and his family's yeah. gonna be okay. But Alejandro at one point just bang 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 kills the two sons and the wife. Uh, the, the wife she does so well. It's the way he says to her. Was it Fausto says like, "What do you think your wife would think about how what you've become?" And Alejandro is just like, "Don't forget my daughter." And you see the wife kind of realize, "Oh Christ, you killed this man's wife yeah. and daughter." But he didn't, I don't know whether he did it himself or whether it was just his pawns or his He gave minions. the order, man. He gave the order, He yeah. gave the order. Yeah. Buck stops yeah. with the person in charge. And so, like you said, he said, he goes, yeah, you, was it? He says, like, you sit here eating every night while you're getting family members killed and, and people are doing your business. Why make it any different? And then he's just like, time to go with God. Bang, bang, bang. And the three bodies hit the floor. And that's when you see real fear in the boss's face. I, I think this actor, even though we only see him like this tiny bit at the end of the movie, he is absolutely selling the point that now he's bloody scared. Like, you're going to kill me after you've made me watch you kill my family in front of me. Yeah. And I love the way that uh, the director as well had it so that the first shot, you can hear him still alive, kind of gargling, kind of suffering. And then Benicio del Toro purposely gets up, puts it closer, and then takes him out. Yeah, brilliant. <sighs> it's just brilliant. <sighs> but it gets better. Yeah, because <laughs> like, the sequence that follows is Kate literally resigned, defeated, mm. questioning everything. And it was something I wanted. To, I was going to mention earlier. Was, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a, a small sort of visual clue as to her mentality as well, because I thought that she was going to slip into. Like of their mentality as the film went on, mm. but she maintained and held on to her integrity of trying to be a good person, morally right person. Yeah. And this this uh, this piece of paper 
is thrust in her face and the pen is thrown at her well, told to just sign it. And Andrew just turns up in her house. She absolutely craps herself. That's right. I mean, we've also seen, I mean, she's psychologically been beaten down yeah. throughout the film where she kind of took to smoking as a uh, as a reprieve from it. But now we just see her smoking just anyway. Yeah, like yeah. That's, that's the thing. But also visually, like in her demeanor, she changes from the beginning to where she is now. But also her clothing does as well. Whereas at the beginning, she's sort of wearing like a it's dark or light blues mm. which is almost like a hero's color yeah but by the end of the film like as the film goes it transitions so she's wearing nothing but gray yeah so she's kind of in the neutral now the she's neutral not seeing now. the black and white she's yeah. gray and uh, she's defeated and she's being forced now to sign this paper at gunpoint pretty much because she's told she's going to be dead if she doesn't do it yeah and she breaks she cries and she's like i am standing by my beliefs and i'm not signing that yeah it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And uh, and he eventually accepts, and then he goes to leave. Yeah. But he does also have one of my favorite lines in the entire film as well, uh, that uh, you're in a land of wolves, and you're no wolf. Yeah. I was just like, oh, it just summarizes the film that's, really, really well. That's... But it gets better. Yeah, it gets better. Because he it? leaves. Yeah. And he's walking away. Yeah. And he had already, already dismantled her weapon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she's put it back together off screen and now she's aiming at him up from the balcony as he's in the car park. Yeah, and he's looking at her like, go on then, do it. But he also knows, he knows her. He knows that she won't, she, yeah. Exactly. But he, also, but he wants her to because... He's the bad guy. She's the he, good guy. Yeah, but, but he wants to be with his family. Everything he, everything he's been doing ever since his family were killed. Well, he's had his vaccine now, hasn't he? As he put it. Yeah, so. yeah. He's ready for. He's just like, if you're gonna kill me, kill me. Everybody else who's tried to hasn't done it, and I'm. It's not like he's he's happy what he's doing, but he's going to continue keep doing doing it because you need somebody like Gillick. And in a weird way, she she gets that. Mm. she gets that you need people like him to do those type of things because she's unwilling on doing it herself that's that's what her takeaway is that's what she's learned from mm. this and, uh, and 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 that's why she's mentally you know distraught because it's such a horrible thing to to experience or be in that position yeah uh, and so yeah it's perfect okay. but it gets better than that <laughs> like winter's ending just keeps hitting every okay. hammer okay. every nail home yeah and uh we cut back to uh to juarez and we see uh, Silvio's uh, son, his, yeah. his boy, yeah. uh, playing football. And we hear sporadic gunshots going off in the background as, mm. the, as the game is broken. But then they go back to playing the game again. Yeah. And, uh, and, and of course, like, it's an everyday occurrence. Or I guess it's even more so now that the, the yeah. cartels have been beheaded. And now there's going to be anarchy and chaos is Fighting. kind of what they wanted. Yeah. Uh, so it's just a dangerous world that they're in. But at the same time, the title of the film drops here at the end. It's another one of those. Mm. And for me, it's very much so sh foreshadowing that Alejandro has basically created a new Sicario in this boy who is probably going to, you know, want to possibly. get revenge. Possibly. Possibly. Uh, it's a possibly. suggestion. I mean, the it's film suggestion. ends it there. Yeah, yeah. So it's very suggestive. You know that mum won't want him to. The consequences of. But he yeah. might grow up to do it. And it's, as we said, it's a recurring thing. You... It's more realistic to, to come to terms for me in a movie where I go, yes, it's going to continue. Can't break the cycle. Can't break the cycle. I know part of me wants it all to be a happy ending and things like that. But this is the real world we live in. And especially with the way that this director tries to tell me these films, that, the, that it's better to tell us the real truth than to pretend the Hollywood lie. You know? Ah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know how oh. accurate this film's depiction of events are to real life. I mean, I'm never, I'll tell <laughs> you right so many... now, I ain't never going to Juarez. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, I'm like, don't get me wrong, like, I'm sure Juarez is an amazing place. I do appreciate that Denis Villeneuve went to Juarez, though, of yeah. course, with protection, just to experience it for real, so yeah. that he could try to incorporate it in the sets and, and reproduce oh, yeah. it as faithfully as possible. Decapitated hanging bodies from the street posts. You know, yeah. 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 William, what were your, your favourite scenes from Sicario? Man, I had so many. Um, and I would list them all right now, but obviously I don't want to steal my good friend's uh, list because I'm sure he's got a load because this was really his first time. Um, so, so for me, I'm easily just going to go with practically everything in the movie. Um, but that final sequence... Where Benicio del Toro coming to the house, 
dealing with them there's the 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 tactical uh the tactical view that they had the way he acts the way he talks to the family as he sat there while he's dealing with the uh the the gang boss who we've not seen it all the way up until this point but it's still absolutely terrifying and intimidating from what we're seeing all the way up to him just taking out that family you know does he feel justified at the end of it does he feel better does he feel worse i don't know but it was oh <laughs> Yeah, there, there's some <laughs> fantastic go, scenes go. in this film. Honestly, for the very first sequence, yes. you know, the inter- the raid going into that house, the, the the brief shootout, finding the bodies. I was just like, what kind of film is this? <laughs> you know? And uh, then the explosion, yeah, rattles you, and uh, and then you you find out where Kate's going, and you're along for the ride. You're invested. You want to find out where all these bodies came yes. from. Uh, so yeah, that the the first fifteen minutes fantastic in terms of getting you invested in the world the characters and and to where it's going to go next the border crossing scene i know i've talked about it a few times uh, but it was exquisitely well shot yeah the action i mean it's not really the, i'm looking at the action was over so quick yeah but the build-up and anticipation to that climax was palpable mm-hmm. and the music score and the performances and the set absolutely outstanding uh, yeah. so yeah the border crossing scene perfect Again, the tunnel raid sequence afterwards because of the way that it was shot, uh, the use of lighting, yeah. and the fact that we don't really get to see much of what's going on, just her perspective as she makes her way through, uh, to them being shot at the end. Do you know what shot I really loved as they were coming? Is you see the groups uh, walking through the desert, and it's all dark, but then as they start to go down a the hill, they kind of dis- disappear how? over the horizon. Oh. Yeah, it was great. It was just some of them putting their, their, yeah. their helmet pieces on. Oh, that was yeah, beautiful. It was great. Uh, the uh, the Alejandro family meal execution sequence. <laughs> it's so tense. Like I'm I'm like, is he going to talk to him? Is he going to just shoot him? Is he going to just walk out? And then uh, yeah, the shock of him sh- executing the entire family as well. It's like, mm. yeah. Like I know you're you're the we're sympathetic because of what happened to you, but we didn't see it. And yeah. usually in a revenge movie, we see that, so we feel sympathetic to you. So, but because we're from Kate's perspective of you, what you're doing is bad, you're questioning it. But at the same Man. time. Oh, I'll be honest, I didn't need to see a little girl from an of acid. Well, no, I know. But <laughs> usually in a film like this, well, and usually in revenge films, you do. Yeah. Because that's the motivation but, then to... But is this a revenge film? It is. It is. Is it? <laughs> it's is all it? about revenge. Is it? Yeah, everything's about revenge nowadays. <laughs> the final scene. I mean, we talked about all of the endings. Yeah. But yeah, every character gets a, a good ending. And the final shot with the title coming up and fading out again... Absolutely perfect. I uh, really, really enjoyed this. But again, I also enjoyed all the little sequences as well, yeah. like uh, where Kate's on the plane and uh, and uh, Alejandro kind of wakes up from a nightmare. Yeah. Again, the nightmare was in the script, but they were like, no, we don't need this. Don't it, need it. it gives too much away. Yeah. And, uh, and she starts asking him questions and he's like... <laughs> You're asking how the watch is made. Just learn to tell the time. And it goes back to sleep again. Or something along those lines. I was like, yeah. oh, the dialogue is so good and it's layered. And that's how it's how cool because Josh Brolin kind of, he just walks onto the plane, kicks his shoes on, goes, he goes to, to sleep nap. right Looks away. Looks like he hasn't had a nap in a day. Exactly. Uh, he says to Kate later on in the film, he's like, you'll learn to sleep on plane soon. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's his lifestyle. That's what he's doing. Yeah. Well, Ian, do you recommend Sicario? I totally uh, recommend Sicario. And I think this director, uh, Denise Villeneuve, I hope I've said that right. Um, I think he's just gone from strength to strength to strength to strength. You know, I I try not to enjoy his movies. I didn't think I was going to enjoy Sicario. I didn't think I was going to enjoy Blade Runner 2049. I didn't think I was going to enjoy Three Hours of Dune and then Three Hours of Dune 2. Um, but... I have just enjoyed absolutely everything that he does. He knows how to capture everything inside the camera frame. He knows to get the best out of his actors without pushing them too far. I mean, I know like at the beginning you said like Benicio Del Toro, you know, you didn't think he was he's great. But as you said, with this film, they took out half of his, his, his lines and he was still able to carry this character from beginning to end with, with barely anything. Emily Blunt is absolutely fantastic in this. She is your character to follow. And though you might look at, say, Josh Brolin's character and be like, oh, he's a bit of a smarmy git. Halfway through the film, you're kind of like, I kind of want to be him. You know, everything is sublime. Everything is perfect. Like I said, it might make you want to go and watch the sequel and you might watch the sequel and go, ah, it's not as great. But still, Benicio Del Toro is badass, isn't it? But this first one, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm also going to be recommending Sicario, and uh, I'm giving this one my highest recommendation of must watch. 
for this has great performances, storytelling, cinematography and music which are just all excellent if not masterful. It's a film that leaves you thinking for a while once it's over, with very strong themes of morality, you know, of right and wrong, and whether the ends justify the means. It's well explored within a narrative that unfolds at a good pace with well-shot action. Emily Blunt is a fantastic actress, and she carries the emotional weight of the story very well. Brilliant performance. Though Benicio Del Toro was the real standout, and for me, his career best. He was mysterious, dangerous and brooding, and he nailed his line delivery in every scene. The cinematography was outstanding, from the lighting, framing and movement, and Roger Deakins focusing the lens exactly where it's needed to get your attention, backed with seamless editing and a haunting and menacing score by Johan Johansson. Now, going into this film, I had my reservations, as its narrative usually doesn't appeal to me, nor did Benicio Del Toro, but I can safely say I was wrong, and that this film deserves to be seen. It's close, if not a masterpiece. It was tense, riveting, surprising, eye-opening, and satisfying, and without doubt, a must-watch. The border is just another line to cross. Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm sorry for- Ah! Fuck! Get it out! Get it the fuck out! Ah!